upon a time, in a small town named Appleton, on a cold November morning, a baby boy named George was born. His heart had been pumping for several months by the time he took his first breath, and it would continue to pump for another 88 years. George grew up in the way that most babies do, from a baby to a toddler, a toddler to a child, a child to a man, and eventually a man to an old man. His life moved at incredible speed until he reached the age of 60 or so, and then he retired, and then his body began to slow down, and things began to break down, and, well, eventually, one night in his 88th year, he went to bed for his final sleep. And that heart, which had been pumping, so faithfully stopped, and his body went cold. Ten years later, in that same Appleton Hospital where George had been born, a baby girl named Emily came into this world. She too grew up from a baby to a toddler, a toddler to a child, and eventually a child to a woman. Then one day in her 34th year, she was sadly killed in a car accident. Now, no one could have predicted this on the day of her birth. No, it was a matter of a thousand singular moments adding up to this one singular and unpredictable outcome. Now, for most of the babies born in Appleton, they lived long, predictable lives like George, but occasionally they lived shorter, unpredictable lives like Emily. In any case, they had one thing in common, and that was the heart, that rhythmic timekeeper ticking away, keeping their bodies warm until their hearts stopped and their bodies went cold. The end. Okay, so why did I tell you that depressing and anticlimactic and overall crap story? <laughs> well, I thought of this story when I was writing my master's thesis. Now, I don't study English and I don't study creative writing. I study something called paleo-oceanography. Now, for those of you who haven't heard about it, it's essentially ocean history. And paleo-oceanographers, we reconstruct the ocean of the past because the ocean and the climate are very intimately connected. So if we know about the ocean of the past, we know a little bit about the climate of the past. So I was working on my master's thesis, and then I came across this picture. This picture. And a thermohaline ocean circulation. And I thought to myself, hmm, that looks a lot like the human cardiovascular system. And then the more I thought about it, I thought, well, actually, it kind of works like the human cardiovascular system. So in the human body, the heart pumps oxygenated blood to our extremities. In ocean circulation, the warm water from the tropics, or the heart of the ocean, is transported to the ocean's extremities, or the poles. In the human body, when our hearts stop, our bodies go cold. In the ocean's past, when ocean circulation has stopped, our Earth has entered a cold phase. In the human body, before we die, usually we begin, begin to age and our bodies slow down and things begin to break down. And likewise, before a cold phase in the Earth, evidence seems to point to that ocean circulation slows down and a series of events occurs. And then lastly, in the same way that most of us live predictable long lives like George, most of the cold phases happen in predictable and cyclical patterns. But occasionally there's a cold phase that is unpredictable or uncyclical, like the life of Emily. Now, I really liked this analogy, so I decided to put it into my master's thesis. I referred to the tropics as the beating heart of this oceanic cardiovascular system. And then I sent it off to my thesis advisor for revision, and he didn't like it as much. In fact, they came back with marks all over the place, and the comment sounds too much like poetry. Okay, so I made some corrections. Okay, well, I corrected everything but the metaphor. I thought, oh, you'll see it's so perfect the second time. And I submitted it again, and the same comment sounds too much like poetry. Um, so then I 
I'm a little bit stubborn and optimistic. I'm like, third time is a charm. He'll finally see it. <sighs> but then it came back with even stronger commentary this time. He said, you really like your bleeping poetry. Yes, I really bleeping do. <laughs> now, I'm not suggesting that the earth literally operates like a giant human. And I'm not suggesting that we enter the realm of pseudoscience and make wild speculations about our natural world. What I am suggesting is perhaps the recognition of similarities between two different things can be a special source of insight. For example, we can think of electricity like water in a pipe or sound and light as waves. Maybe by thinking of the tropics like a beating heart of an oceanic cardiovascular system and the earth living and dying like a human, maybe this will give us some more insight into the mechanisms that control these systems. This isn't the first time I've tried to use metaphors or colorful imagery in my scientific work. Um, in fact, a few months ago, I gave a presentation where I made a diarrhea metaphor about the steady state ocean with some lovely pictures, <laughs> of course. <laughs> and at that moment, I could see the eyes of my fellow classmates light up, and I think they were at least listening for that one moment. I mean, how could they not diarrhea? <laughs> But I could see out of the corner of my eye that my professor, she was not so amused. And this is the feedback I've received for most of my scientific career, that whenever I've used imagery or visualization, that these devices must be left out. That is, that the arts and the sciences must be segregated. So the frontier that I would like to see crossed or should I say, the barrier, which I would like to see broken down, is the barrier that exists between the arts and the sciences. So what is it exactly that the arts has to offer the sciences? Well, for one, metaphors and visualization are very good at offering new perspectives. Sometimes new perspectives is all that's needed to spark the idea that leads to discovery. And in fact, throughout the history of science, some of the biggest discoveries were not made through actual experiment, but were made within the human mind and imagination. One such example is, oh no, where's Dimitri? One such example is Dimitri Mendeleev, not him. Uh, <laughs> one such example is Dimitri Mendeleev. He went to bed one night and he dreamt of a table where all the elements fell logically into place. He then went on to develop what we know as the periodic table. This handsome gentleman right here named Isaac Newton, I think we know, all know his story. He was apparently sitting outside and he saw an apple fall from a tree. And this visual element was the spark that led him to develop his laws of gravity. Next, we have Albert Einstein. Albert Einstein began to develop his laws of relativity, again, not through actual experiment, but through storytelling-like thought experiments, such as asking himself, what would it be like to chase a light beam? Okay, so we have, um, Arts and visualization, they can give us new perspectives, which give us that light bulb moment. What else? Well, new perspectives have an uncanny way of telling us that we're chasing after the wrong conclusion or trying to answer the wrong question. There's a famous joke, which I think is a very good example of this. Um, so one second. Okay. So Sherlock Holmes and John Watson are on a camping trip. They go to bed for the night, they're lying down, looking at the sky, and then Holmes turns to Watson and says, Watson, look up into the sky and tell me what you see. So Watson, he looks up into the sky and he says, well, I see millions of stars. Holmes says, mm-hmm, mm-hmm, very good. What does that tell you? Watson thinks for a moment and then he says, well, it tells me there's millions of galaxies and possibly millions of planets. Holmes turns angrily to Watson and he says, Watson, you idiot. 
It means somebody has stolen our bloody tent. <laughs> so one more thing that arts and visualization are very good at is communicating complex concepts. For example, I can very easily communicate the concept of Einstein's bending of the fabric of space-time simply by telling you to imagine a piece of fabric pulled tightly and a bowling ball in the center. Uh, I remember in high school we learned about ionic bonds being like a marriage between two atoms and 10 years later I can still imagine an atom giving another atom an electron ring and that imagery has stuck with me to this day. Now, as science continues to specialize, it's going to be more and more difficult to keep up with the new knowledge we uncover. Now, most scientific papers these days are written in English, and English happens to be my native language. And yet, generally, I have to read through them two or three times just to translate incomprehensible scientific jargon into English I can understand. And that's just within my own field. As soon as I try to read physics or chemistry or biology, it's a little bit like trying to understand Klingon. And this is a problem, especially for climate scientists, because climate is not restricted to one field. It includes all of them. This is also a problem because if someone like me, who is scientifically literate and loves science, finds it challenging to keep up with new concepts and the new discoveries, what about the non-scientifically literate audience? My own family doesn't really know what I do. They always say ocean something, something, something. <laughs> I think it's because they're too afraid to ask because they, like a lot of people, think that science is something beyond them, that is only for the scientists. And I disagree. I think that everybody benefits from having a deeper understanding of the natural world. And if we encourage young scientists to bring storytelling and visualization and metaphors into their work, this might be the bridge that connects the non-scientifically literate audience to this knowledge. Now, as I've already said, my master's thesis experience and throughout my scientific career overall has shown me this is not the case. We're generally discouraged because after all, science is based upon testable, and verifiable methods removed from biased human imagination, right? So how can the arts exist within this world? You know, this question of coexistence really isn't that much different than the question that each of us deals with in our daily lives, this conflict of two paradoxical worlds. For example, this either-or thinking, like, how can I be independent in thought and action, but still exist harmoniously within a group? Or how can I have a smooth, effective running system, but still make room for individual needs? And with the arts and sciences, how can I understand the world through verifiable and testable methods, removed from biased human imagination, but then use human imagination to understand the world in ways that cannot yet be tested or verified. I strongly believe that if we just have the courage to break down this barrier that exists between these two worlds, we'll see that coexistence is so much stronger than exclusion. Now, I thought it was appropriate to end a talk on the power of metaphor and visualization to offer new perspectives and communicate ideas with a metaphor or analogy of my own. So I want everyone now to imagine a chessboard. Now, in the game of chess, a bishop can only move diagonally. That is chess law. A castle can move forward or sideways or backwards, and that is also chess law. In fact, we know all the laws of the chessboard for every single game of chess. And yet, Despite knowing exactly how the game of chess works and all the laws, we still don't know the outcome. Why is that? There are more possible games of chess than there are atoms in the universe. So what does that tell us? It tells us understanding the laws and the principles is not enough 
to understand the outcome. So science is the field that tells us how the pieces move. It works to reduce it down to the laws and the principles at the heart of the system. The arts tell us what happens when these pieces interact, what emerges. And any good chess player, if they want to understand the game of chess, they wouldn't learn just how the pieces move or just what happens in the end. They would have to understand both together. And likewise, if we want to understand our world the best we can, we cannot just learn the laws and the principles, and we can't just know what emerges. We have to understand both together. So science and art, they don't go knife to knife. They go hand in hand. Thank you. Mm -hmm.